the, the seminar is recorded as usual. It will be made available on our YouTube channel. Um, if you continue participating in the seminar of the recording, it means that you agree for the recording to be publicly disseminated. I would recommend you mute your microphone and turn off your camera um, if you don't want to be seen or heard. Um, so I want to thank the Magnets team, uh, Greg, Anik, Richard, Dan, uh, that uh, started this and this is going well. Um, I'm really happy of this series of seminar. I hope you're enjoying them as well. And so we'll have about 20, 30 minutes presentation. Um, if you, it's an informal uh, place. So if you need to go, don't worry about it. The seminar are recorded. There is going to be time for 10, 15 minutes questions and discussion. And then uh, there is going to be a time for catch up, which is not recorded. And I hope you can stay. Um, for, so for today, I'm really happy that we have Uwe Kircher uh, from Tübingen, Germany, uh, talking about assembly of Proto-Australia during the formation of the Nuna supercontinent in the Paleoprotozoic. Thanks, Uwe. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, to... All right. Can you see this, my screen? Yeah. Thank okay. You. Okay. So thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity yeah, to, to give this talk. That's, that's very nice. Um, yeah, to keep in touch with the community in, in these times. And um, so I'm going to talk about yeah, the um, stuff I've been doing over the past years, really, um, starting the time when I was in Australia together with, with Lee in, in Curtin in Perth. And um, so I was working mainly on on the Nuna supercontinent. So um, yeah, I will I will start with an introduction about supercontinents and and the like the Precambrian um, view we have right now on the on the evolution of the yeah really the paleogeography in on on Earth in the last let's say two billion years or, or and beyond like um, and in this time the the in the paleogeography really the um the concept of supercontinents is really one of the the dominating one in the, in this time and um yeah so this is a, a small picture about from a restaurant i found in in tubing and so the new the name is really a bit misleading because it's it's coming from from paul hoffman's view of, of florentia of, so um, i think like continents bordering the northern ocean so, but but still, it it, it was um, it kept being there. So so now it's called Nuna or Columbia, which which is really only a name. So, but I started with Nuna, so I I kind of stick with it. So to begin with, just a, um, I, I had this in in another presentation, but um, um, like starting working on it, I I um, the interesting thing about about Nuna is really the to me, the how how the um, Earth really transitioned towards an Earth where we kind of think we understand most of the things, and one of the the key mechanisms, Earth, Earth um, uh, like mechanisms on Earth, is is really plate tectonics, and especially when it's related, as we see it today, with with mantle dynamics and and the long term mantle evolution, and and as we know now that that only with plate tectonics. Um, the, the climate on, on a long time scale um, can, um, can stay stable. So um, this is like with the with weathering in, in subduction zones and, and weathering of, of like basaltic large igneous provinces and stuff like that is only with that the, the, um, the climate on earth can be stable over a long period of time. And at least as I understand it, we needed this time for, for complex life to evolve. We, I mean, we're not sure how this, how this took place, but we know that there was a long time when, when like single cell um, stuff was, was already existing until the, the, like the explosion of, of life and the end of the Precambrian. And then, I mean, also an interesting thing, which is not that um, I think understood that well, is that the biodiversity is really, um, um, or can be connected to, to the, um, like, 
if there if all continents were together or, or separated so we need kind of a mosaic of plates for the biodiversity to 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 expand or at least it's related so all these things um lead to the to the assumption that we really need plate tectonics um on our uh, for the for earth to become a habitable planet and that makes it interesting um to to look at other planets and say okay if it, is it even possible on other planets um, to 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 for life to to evolve or, or like what do we need for for other planets? But that's I mean this is all a bit like just to to make it interesting is not so much what I I would talk about. But um, so there was this um, kind of battle. I don't I don't know who of you heard this about uh, um, with with Taras Garia and and Bob Stern on one hand like the. The, the evolutionary people and then the uniformitarian people. And I thought this was very interesting because this is a big problem in, especially in the paleogeographic evolution. And to start um, like Taras Garia, especially, and also Bob Stern, they say um, the, like the transition from a, like a Venus-like squishy lit tectonics planet towards a modern side plate tectonics earth um, took a long, time when when transitional what they call transitional tectonics took place and is really not not sure how long did this take took and they claim that even like before one billion years ago or maybe even later only then would it be possible to to um like to have this this plate tectonics modern style plate tectonics earth what, what we have today like when we have a lot of um like the mosaic of plates like connected to the to to like mantle convection and to, to this large low shear wave velocity provinces and this supercontinent cycle as we understand it also this um and they claim with with especially taras with with some modeling that this cannot be at two billion years ago this was not possible because the mantle was just hotter and the, all the the sub subducting plates was were just um just um dripping off but on the other hand like when we we the the approach we make with with the supercontinent cycle is really this picture which um like i've seen a lot of times and then i mean you you see pangea obviously i mean a lot of people working on that and then there's rodinia which is like more or less um yeah a lot of people like think is fine like they know how it how it looks like there's still debates like in all these these old times you always have debates but then this, if you draw this picture, like there is another supercontinent, we're fairly sure about that. And, but if, if you start this, you say, okay, there was supercontinent cycles throughout earth history, maybe as old as 3 billion years ago. And what these other, like the evolutionary people say that this just cannot work in the same way as, as it works today. So um, like the onset of plate tectonics, this is a, like a bit of a misleading term because plate tectonics is uh, like different people um, would define it very differently. But yeah, this is just to, to show that there's, there's a, a, a time span where, where different people would say very different things about the, about the onset of, of plate tectonics. So just a, a slide on the supercontinent segment. To me, this is really the uh, most, um, yeah, uh, maybe significant paper of Lee and together with Shiji Chong, where, where they, um, um like they um make kind of the the concept of the supercontinent cycle and this the present day the like as we see it today with with the two llsvps and then there were papers about the future supercontinent i mean there's also different um, suggestions there is um then like pangea the the old supercontinent we all know about and i mean there's always the the problem that there also was Gondwana. So what is actually a supercontinent? There's also like how many of the continents actually have to be together to define a supercontinent and, and which is the real supercontinent. And then there's Rodinia. And then there is um, like the suggestion of these ancient super plumes or ancient LLSVPs. And then Lee draw this, this picture of, of the, the like intensity of plume events where he saw some cyclicity and there definitely is some cyclicity, but I mean, if it if it that easy or, or not, that's 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 very de debated, I think. But uh, yeah, then he he made this like um, some of the the 
reconstructions of Rodinia where they form somewhere. And then they, they create the super plume beneath them. And then true polar wonder will put them on the, on the paleo equator, which is, is rotationally more stable. And I mean, then the, 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 the key thing of this paper is really that they, like she, she made this modeling, like where, where blue is downwelling, I think, and, and yellow is upwelling. And they started with a, like a random distribution. And then they showed that this will always like the, the downwellings will, will cluster and, and then lead to the supercontinent formation on top of, of this. And then this supercontinent with, with um, yeah, with, with the, the subduction ring around them will create the uh, like, yeah, the, um, um, old um, slab material and this will create then, then a, a super plume and this will in the end destroy the supercontinent and then it will, uh, this girdle will move and this uh, will, the next supercontinent will form. And this is kind of the, yeah, the, this, the concept of how supercontinents or how this cycling is, is, is working. And uh, more recently, um, Ross and, and Chong Wang wrote this geology paper where they, they argued, um, yeah, based on some geochemistry arguments that there was always this pairing of mega continents with supercontinents. This is kind of the, the attempt to, to solve this Gondwana Panchia thing. And I mean, what you, uh, yeah, this is all very, very conceptual. This is, um, to me, this is not really like um, the, the key thing. I mean, what is interesting to note is that a lot of times the the assembly of the one supercontinent is really overlapping with the with the destruction of the old one. So the and this is all related to how you actually define the supercontinent cycle and how you define a supercontinent. And and so there's a lot of to me still a lot of problems. And a lot of this is related to that people want to make this a very um, cyclic um, evolution. Like this all has to be the same. So there has to um, this this the tenure of one supercontinent has to stay the same more or less. And yeah, I mean, since there is a lot of um, uncertainty, this is all possible. So yeah, but in the end, this is the like the status we have right now. And I mean, if you, as you have seen before, we the, the limits were pushed further back and, and um, other supercontinents were also proposed. And um, um, concerning this issue, on a on a like a Archean supercontinent, the um, one of the stu the PhD students at Curtin at the time I was there was studying uh, dike dikes in in like um, in the West Australian craton, so so close to Perth, and this is a, a great area. He, he made his PhD there, and he was doing paleomech on all these dikes. And um, um, in the past, it was believed that there was just one or two dike swarms, but he actually showed with with um, geochronology, which was another PhD, that that there's many um, like different um, dike swarms of, of very different age between 2.6 and and like um, I don't know the youngest are like 700. So um, these red ones are the are the the Archean dikes, and he has had very nice results like close to, this is um, susceptibility versus temperature, close to, to pure um, magnetite um, Curie temperatures and, and nice nice directions. And he compared this with, um, so uh, these are even dual polarity, the results of the side mean directions. And he compared this with other other um, results from, from this area. And there was no, um, like, um, I mean, we, we couldn't perform an actual back contact test, but, the main argument was the dual polarity to some extent, and then the, the they don't the, the mean don't coincide with with other um, other results from this area, and the mean temperature component even might be related to the Vichimuta dike swarm, like a bit younger, two point four, and this is two point six. So this, um, um, yeah, we argue that this is an argument that this is uh, actual primary directions. And um, this is a compilation now of, of Zimbabwe and, and Yilgan, so the West Australian craton. And he had two possibilities where, I mean, the, the orientation is still not, not decided. But the, the, the main um, result to me is, these are his two options. So the supercontinent solution, where we tried really hard to put together all cratons at the time, which was um, proposed before to form a supercontinent. And, 
uh, this is possible, but only if there's two separate supercontinents at 2.6 and 2.4, which a lot of motion in between, relative motion. But the, the much more likely um, option to me is that actually two clusters of, of gratons were, were present at this time, where, as I said, this was the time where Kenwa land, of the, the Archean supercontinent was proposed. And to me, this is good evidence. So not much um, actual plate motion is necessary. This could um, even be true polar wonder because both clusters moving the same way. But this to me shows that, that the, it's much more likely that super, this, these clusters of cratons were present in the Archean. And like supercontinents really only started in the, in the Proterozoic. So, and um, now to the, to the, to the Proterozoic, the, the supercontinent Nuna, if there was no Archean supercontinent, then Nuna might really be the, the first one. And so this is, um, Nuna is a very interesting one because um, it, um, it, this is um, the trial circon um, just counts. And it, on one hand, it has a huge um, significant peak there. So a lot of, of stuff was formed at, at this time. And not only the supercontinent form, but, but close like 2 billion years ago, most of the major cratons formed, like Laurentia, Baltica, Australia, they all formed at this time and then they all came together. So it seems that this really represents a, a special time in, in Earth history. And then what um, my colleague did, Bo Wan, is that he, he did some, some size, a very detailed seismic profile in, in North China. And, and he argued that this, um, the results look very similar to what he's seen in the Himalaya. And then he compared this with other, other results. And he claimed at the end that this um, was the first time that actually large scale tectonic systems were in place by during at 1.8 during the formation of the lunar supercontinent. And he claimed this was really the onset of, of plate tectonics. And what, what, what we then did is we, we, we um, uh, studied 1.3 billion year old uh, um, Darum, Darum silt from North Australia. And um, so this is our updated configuration of, of Nuna, this Laurentia, um, Siberian Baltica. This is what, what people say that the core of Nuna of, David Evans called it that, and, and um, um, Richard Ernst made some, some um, correlations with dikes and, and claimed that this was really a long history of, of um, but, but this is not, not that big. And we added Australia and North China with, with some, yeah, with paleomech data and also the correlation of, of these of this seals and dikes. And, and this is our then proposal, how Nuna actually looked like. And this is really a proper size, sized supercontinent. So this is at, at 1.3 at this, and this was, and this is how we, so we, we made um, also not only paleomech and, and, and actually the, the, that the seals were, or, or the, the, the configuration of the dikes, but also the, um, like the TOC record of, of the Shamaling formation, the Vicari formation here, that they show the same excursion at, at like, yeah, more or less similar times. And what I then did is I made a compilation of, of all poles if, if Nuna was, was really like this between 1.7 and 1.3. And I mean, there's some wiggling, but, but um, generally a, a combined apparent polar wonder path is, is really possible at least for, for Nuna. And it shows that it just rotated very slightly at the, at the Pali equator at that time. All right, then um, to, to move to the, the assembly of Nuna, um, we studied at 1.79 or 1.8 um, GA um, um, hard dollar right in Australia. And there we proposed that um, like the, one of the key connections in the Nuna supercon is, is between Laurentia and Australia from, from like apart from this core of Nuna thing. And this um, apart from a, a small reorganization between 1.73 and 1.65, this was um, all like all already connected at 1.8. So to me, the, the like, even though people argue that, that the Nuna only formed at 1.6, but not much happened between 1.8 and 1.6. And um, this is kind of similar to what happened in, um, in Rodinia and maybe also in Pangea with the, like this mega shear, for example, this, this, um, Evolutions like this, like reorganization of supercontinents once it, they formed, might not be so, uh, so unusual. 
and um, so then the um, the two new things which are not published yet, but which I'm I'm working on now is um, to further um, like now characterize how how Nuna actually assembled. So before or around 1.8. So what what happened? And and if because if we can um, if we can further describe this this assembly, then we might be able to to com actually compare. The, the assembly of Nuna with with other supercontinents, because as I said before, the it might really be the the first of its of its kind and and might um, represent a big transition in, in in the paleogeographic evolution of the Earth. So I went to to two places. One one is is at the Kimberley Craton in North Australia, uh, yeah, in the in the western part of North Australia, and then in the the Plum Tree Creek Volcanics, which they were supposed to be close in age i mean if if like i'm also not only working in the precambrian and 30 million years is a long time but um in the precambrian or especially in the paleoproterozoic we have to do like the best we can and this were the two places with the most promising rocks like like a ring in the toby ring intrusion mafic um ring intrusion in the kimberley craton and then and then like a bimodal volcanics in the um, yeah, close to Darwin, and and yeah, they are they are not the same age, but as I said, yeah, this this what the, the two of the most promising targets to compare the paleogeography just before the the assembly of Nuna, and yeah, these again the the age ranges. So these the Toby intrusion, this the Plum Tree, and to to make a better kind of comparison, we also measured a VGP of uh, another intrusion, like a Wild Dog Creek intrusion, which is close to the Toby intrusion. And these are the two um, orogenies, which which uh, supposed to to um, represent the the assembly of the North Australian craton. So this is really related to the assembly of of Australia. That's what we know. And so my my goal was to to see how this fits in the the global the global framework of of assembly of of Nuna. And this is the ring intrusion, very beautiful, like the, the green stuff here is the Toby intrusion. And this is our sampling sites. This is, um, this is the, the location here. Um, and this is the result, very nice. Again, I mean, this is all the stuff I, I all the dike seals, um, may fix stuff as I worked on, on from, the, from Australia, they look the same, like these KT curves and, and um, AF alternating field and, and thermal DMAC look pretty similar. And these are the side mean directions and the overall mean direction, very shallow. Um, and the argument to say it's, it might really be a primary one is there was another, another study by Austin and Patterson in, in 2020. They studied a, also a ring intrusion a bit north of, of our intrusion. And they found this direction, which is very close to the direction we found in the Durham Durham seals from 1.3 billion years old and they claim is a remagnetization based on some other arguments some ams arguments and um yeah because this is not not at all what we're seeing in in our results that's made us believe that that this actually um should be a, a primary pole um um yeah that they, they, we tried to do some back contact tests but i mean this is really like heavily weather you don't you don't see a lot of outcrops and i mean no contacts at all in this area so we have some overprints some present day and some some very steep ones which are also reported in other areas but yeah so so this is all the all the arguments we have and then the so the plum tree creek volcanics is a bit of a, a tricky target because they have been studied a lot of times in the past by by um uh, Evans, Hart, and uh, uh, yeah, um, I'm, uh, since the, like the 70s or something, and then they have been restudied by Itnom and Giddings, but um, all this is not properly presented. So, so we we went there again to to restudy them and see if we if we get the same results. And now I'm in the in the process of of um, getting together with these other people, which are. Um, not all retired, but are all, um, yeah, not actively working on this anymore, but they all have, have still results from the plum tree volcanics. And I, I want to put everything together, but yeah, I, I will show you my results, which, so this is the, 
this is the the place where they are like at one point at the age changed a bit not that much and then there is um the above the edith river group there's a, a tectono metamorphic event at, at 1.78 and then not much is happening after that so the 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 north australian craton is i mean this is we have this um um, we have evidence for this from from other places that not really not much happened in the in this area after this time. And these are the results of the side effects again. Um, and um, the problem is that the the bedding is is really not much. There there is a like a syncline, but um, the bedding um, attitudes are really not not that. It's not folded very much. So we have this picture where, where it, it looks it looks fairly similar, and we get a, a soon falling um, maximum clustering, but not not a lot of variation. So my goal really is to, to compare this with the with other data, which the raw data was not presented in this in these old studies. So um, they they promised me to dig out the, the the raw data, and then I want to redo this. But a, a soon falling event might only be possible at this 1.78 um, event. And, and we don't see a, um, like this is the result. We don't see that they agree with the, with the hard dollar right, which is the more or less the same age. So this is the, my poll from the hard dollar right. This is the old plum tree poll and the new one. They, they, they agree fairly well with each other. So um, yeah, this for now we, um, I I will take it as a yeah as a poll, but then more more stuff needs to be done to really verify that this is a primary poll. But yeah, around 1.8 is this um this is the result for now. And these are the, the two results from the Toby intrusion. And um so and this is a comparison with all the data from this area. And the the first and most interesting result is that there they all cluster in this area. Like this is really data between 1.88 GA and um, like 1.65 when, when it starts to, to move away the, 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 um, the paleopoles. And then there is some slight motion and whatever this wiggling is, but um, um, my, my argument would be that, that if the Toby and Wild Dog, if they, they agree fairly well with each other, if they, they are more or less the same age as this plum tree pole, then like a, a really small rotation between the, the Kimberley and, and the North Australian Craton. So this is the Kimberley is these two and the plum tree is this one here. And this would, would be sufficient to, to assemble the, the like the Proto-Australia as, as, as they, they put it. So um, make this a bit more um, with a bit more, more bigger maps and more um, like paleogeographic information like this is from before if we if we use this this is a um, yeah like the age is is really um, vaguely defined and I used like a we have a reconstruction at 1.88 which everything is a bit more loosely defined but and then we have a like this is our our reconstruction at 1.8 and if we I mean, really, not much is it's, is is necessary. And if this um, is um, is is related to just the just in, um, um, putting the all the cratons closer together, and this might be then the reason why the Kimberley and Australia made this rotation and this um, this um, move movement um, together to form Nuna. This might have been the reason for for this rotation to, to take place, and um, to further like investigate if oops, if the um, if this can be possible, like North China here. This was um, yeah where Bovan was working, and and he pro this is the the um, trans China um, zone here, and um, so. If this is if reasonable to put the Kimberley Craton close to the North China crat Craton at, at this time, we I was looking at, at the trial circon data from there's a big compilation by Hollis in, in 2014, and they had this this like near Archean peak at like around 2.5 GA, and they have fairly positive epsilon hafnium values. 
And they were relating this either to another area in, in North Australia or to India. But what I would say is that this fits very well to the Eastern Bloc of North China with, with very similar ages. So this is now granites and, and all sorts of, of primary data and all the similar Epsilon Hafner values. So this the trial um, zircon populations here might really come from the, from the Eastern part of the North China Craton. So this like configuration of Luna prior to assembly might really make sense. So they all come from, from this area. This two, oh, there's a lot of rocks of this age there. India, of course, is, might also be there, but then, I mean, we need more data. India has like more data is coming, but, but we really have not enough information to really verify the results already there. So um, like this is all in, in progress, this, this refining this, um, the, the paleogeography. But what, what to me is interesting and, and what I think is we should like paleogeographers in this, in this age, we should not try to, to identify the supercontinents, which I mean, this we have done a lot of a long time. But um, to me, the, the Nuna assembly really looks a bit different to what, what we would expect. And apparently, at, even before 1.8, this all these, these the, the cratons forming, they were all already close to the paleo equator. And then just just slight um, um, like yeah um, moving together led then to the formation of Nuna. Then some some stuff was going on, but this was really a long period of time. And um, reading the um, this GSA um, article by Bob Stern, this I really wonder if this. Um, this more reflects the, the transition towards the supercontinent cycle, which just starts with Rodinia and not before. And, and this, the long existence of Nuna was really, I mean, I mean, maybe not, uh, I mean, it de depends on what you, what you think about a single lit tectonics, but this, this, this slow rotation, this slow assembly of Nuna might, might be, it might be more, um, yeah, I mean, not true, but it might be more to more reasonable to say that this is is related to like a single tectonic um, evolution rather than a like a yeah proper um, modern style plate tectonics evolution. All right, thank you. That was a bit long, but <laughs> that was great. It. Thank you very much, Uwe, for your presentation. Let's give Uwe a big round of applause. Maybe you can unshare your screen. I think we can see your email. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, it's now time for questions, if there is any. Um, you can, uh, oh, okay. There is one question from Nicole. Uh, does the upwelly and downwelly location driven by rotation axis and rate slide four? Uh, wait, um, does the I don't up... think I, I understood the question. Sorry, location. I'll try. Rich, Richard, do you think you understand the question? Oh, um, mm. oh, Nicole, thanks. Yes, no. please express <laughs> yourself. <Thanks. laughs> um, so slide four, um, I think uh, um, it was some modeling of like... Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, Should I share it again? Yeah, that would be nice. But um, was that like the, they kept getting like the same, I think you said that they kept getting somewhat uh, like the same results, but like is the upwelling like location and del downwelling the like green or the blue and red? Um, uh, uh, wait, wait, wait. wait. Uh, I think it, okay. This one here? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Uh, and I was just curious, like, is it like, is there like um like is the the rotation axis and then the rate have to like does that play a role? Do you think that would play a role in like where the um oh. up welling, welling would be? Yeah, yeah, no, no, definitely. I mean, as far as I understand this, this the formation where where it takes place is rather like wherever if they they form somewhere. And then through polar wonder would bring it to the equator because this, I mean, this is an excess in mass where, where you have a lot of this, this um, subduction, a lot of plates. 
So the rotation stability, we put it to the equator. That, that's how I understand the, the model. And I'm not sure how, um, I, I, never, I never saw a talk by Shishi about this. So I, as far as I, I understand the paper, it's just, this is a self-organizing process of the, 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 like the, the individual downwellings. They, they've come together and then they form this, this super downwelling and then it moves to the equator. And then it, it goes from there. There is some, some problem in connecting the, the, the four steps, I think. Like this was not out, out, automatically happening as far as I understand it. But yeah, that's at the um, concerning where, where it, it happens. I, I don't really know if, if, they, if they have any, any specific results on that or if this is just one result or if, the, if this may look different in different runs. I, I don't know. When you say um, it goes to the equator, you mean like the supercontinent tends to the equator? Yeah. So, so true polar wonder. So it's um, like the whole, um, the whole continent mantle, um, crust mantle thing moves relative to the spin axis. This, this is the, the argument because there's, yeah, there's, if you have this, I mean, the, it, it makes sense that these these LLSVPs and the supercontinent are at the equator. And a, a very interesting thing is that the only time when this happened apparently is Rodinia. And I don't know if this is if this is so um, if everyone believes this is this is true. But it's interesting that Nuna formed at the equator, and and Pangea also formed kind of at the equator. So, I mean, at at some point, I I mean, I would even say the you could even say that they were there the whole time, like what um, other people more working the final so I think they argue. From a Nuna perspective, this can as well be true. Like the, you know, the, the like these mantle, lower mantle structures are stable over the whole period of time and the supercontinents form and get destroyed. I'm, I'm like independent of that. But, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of unknowns definitely in this, in this, in this story. Thank you. Thank you for your question and thanks for the answer, Uwe. Uh, someone else's questions? Um, if I yes, can, I'll jump in with a question. Um, uh, and just, um, really fascinating. You, you talked a little bit about how Nuna, it, it sort of stalled or there was a reconfiguration and they, you kind of mentioned you've seen that in, in other supercontinents. Is it, did you, does it seem to have like the same style of stalling? Do you have any idea what's kind of happening or is it just sort of something that happened in Nuna that sort of stood out? Yeah, I mean, um, like Nuna, we really have not a lot of data. And, and what, what we saw is that we like, you could, you could do this, like the, the fitting the poles is better matched by a different configuration. And one way to get there is, is, a, is a strike slip reorientation. And they, uh, Bin Wen proposed this for Rodinia to like this story about the missing link. And the, the mega she is also like that. And I mean, we, working on Nuna, like there's so many uncertainties and we, we don't really know a lot. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that, okay, this has to be the same, but, but I always thought, okay, I mean, you put that, you, you, you smash together a bunch of continents and if the, the configuration is not perfect, then you would have like, you would try to make it round, let's say, because this is like, you have a lot of subduction everywhere. And if it's, if it's pushing more on one side, then you would, you would get it um, a better align maybe. I don't know, I mean, but um, I just like, this is just, I, I thought it interesting when I saw this paper from Bin Wen that this happened also in Rodinia. And I think, yeah, that the style is, is really looks similar because it's, yeah, strike slip motion be between big parts of, of, the, of the supercontinent. And yeah, maybe. <laughs> Thank you. That's, it's, it's, it's interesting. I'm trying to process, you know, like you said, there's so little data you have to yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> work hard to fill it all in. Yeah, I mean, there's still a lot of a lot of uncertainties in in this. I I always think it's it's very interesting how 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 the the poles are all, all, like how this configuration of Nuna can be can be so 
close together. And this is, and because I would say this, it is, it seems to be the first one, then the assembly story of Nuna might really be an interesting part where we, we need more data, obviously. And it's like working, uh, getting new poles in the, in the pre-Cambrian. This is, is a, is a bit of a frustrating story because you, you have to, you have to work hard and then you get one small um, additional piece and then you you put a continent a bit further away like the plum tree old pole this was a good pole and now we went there again and we did it again and we, we put and at the end it will it will end up at the same at the same position and then we're still not not sure if this like the whole remagnetization thing this is a big problem and then we don't and especially if you have poles close together you you don't really know and Getting a big contact test is sometimes so difficult in this in this area. So, yeah, I mean we have to yeah keep working, I guess. And and uh, yeah. Thanks. We understand very well the frustration of uh, having a lot of work and a very good data out of that. Uh, maybe you can unshare your screen. Uh, so, somebody else has a question. That wants to share. I had a uh, just a hi. Thanks. Comment. Um, the you you base your is this possibly remagnetized on on the fold test, and um, since I think you used my fold test, <laughs> uh, I I'm wondering what happens if you add. I mean, it's just barely not a hundred, right? So mm. I was wondering what happens if you add uncertainty in the in the in the orientations. Uh -huh. Well, there is that option, or there used to be when I first published it, that you could, you know, like have an uncertainty in the in the poles to the planes, and then you add that uncertainty in, that'll widen your <laughs> your error bars. <laughs> Yeah. You, don't, you know strikes and dips exactly mm -hmm. and so um uh, you could you could get a hundred percent that's great I, I i was wondering about this a lot of times and i always assumed that you um, i mean yeah i always like i calculated the mean bedding because like a lot of in these cases, mm -hmm. I I took 10, 10 bedding measurements and they are like sometimes very different. And then I, I take, okay, this is also related to the measurement and maybe this is the mean and then I apply the mean. But yeah, and the, the way that you did it, you assume that you know that perfectly. But then if you if you sub if you did a Monte Carlo sampling of the actual distribution of bedding planes too. And if it's not in this current version of the um, full test, it yeah. could be added easily. I, I think it is in there. Okay, I have to look for it. That's that's a great oh. thing. Yeah. Then and then I, you uh, just kind of say, <laughs> yeah, it could be a hundred. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to me, I was happy that it's not zero. So it's, it's, it's not like after folding. So yeah. No, but it's the not pre-folding. And it's... Um, I, I'm I'm sure that if you add in the uncertainty in the bet in yeah. the, that you'll widen that and you'll include a hundred percent. Okay, that's great. Thanks. <laughs> I will try that. If the code needs some work, just let me know. And I'll, yes. Yes. No. This is a, this is a great code. <laughs> this thank God is there. And this like Python these scripts I use like Linux and then you can script all this and it's very nice. Like yeah. I. There's so you many try to Jupyter notebooks. They're even better. They're wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they work on on Linux. Mm. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Uwe. I think unless there is some burning question, I think uh, we can uh, uh, we can wrap up. We want to thank again Uwe with another big round of applause. Thank you very much. Thanks. I'm going to share.